Afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to Keating Chambers Energy Seminar Part Two of 2021. Um, we've got a great lineup for you today. Um, before I introduce the speakers, um, I'll just deal with some of the logistics. Please, can you use the Q and A box to ask the panel any questions and submit them as we go through? And then we're going to make time for about 20 minutes of Q&A at the end where we'll pick up your questions. Um, we've had an internal discussion about the difficult questions that are likely to be asked by our highly sophisticated audience. And Sam and James have both said that they're very keen for that sort of question to be submitted. So please don't hesitate to put them in. Um, I'm going to introduce the speakers in the order we're going to hear from them. Um, and the first thing I need to do is offer apologies from Charlie Banner QC, who was due to be speaking today. Um, unfortunately, he has a clash. He is right now interviewing um, the Archbishop of Canterbury for Have I Got Planning News For You, which I'm sure you appreciate was a, an appointment which was difficult for him to cancel. Um, but we've got a great lineup. Um, first of all, we've got James Thompson. He's one of our superstar senior juniors, and he is gonna talk about arbitrating energy disputes and the implications of the Supreme Court decision in Halliburton. And in particular, he's going to talk about the effect of the Supreme Court's decision in the context of an arbitration with a London seat and no institutional rules on the party's potential desire to appoint the same arbitrator for multiple references arising out of the same incident or where there are overlapping issues. Um, then I'm going to do the middle talk um, and I'm going to talk about managing change. Um, I'm going to run through issues relating to instructions and the circumstances in which the contractor has to comply with instructions, but focusing in particular on notice condition precedents um, in the energy standard form contracts. And then lastly, we've got Sam Townend, who is our latest silk in chambers. Congratulations, Sam. I think he's formally entitled to his letters in March. And I can honestly say that I've never looked forward to a silk party so much before. Um, Sam is going to talk about developments in the law in relation to green and renewable energy projects and he will argue that there are some particular common characteristics associated with this emerging sector that are separate or distinct from other constructional energy work. Um, so I will hand over to James to start us off. Um, thank you very much and speak to you shortly. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Lucy. Um, hopefully I can make this work. Um, obviously been practiced many times. Um, so uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, I'm uh, James Thompson, as Lucy has, has just um, mentioned. Over the next 25 minutes or so, I'll be discussing the the long-awaited um, <clears throat> decision of the Supreme Court in Halliburton and Chubb and its implications for arbitrating energy disputes. Uh, no doubt many of you will be familiar with the decision in Halliburton and Chubb. Uh, first of all, um, I'll give a quick recap of the facts and the decision itself. Uh, this was an arbitration that arose um, out of the a dispute concerning the explosion and fire on the Deepwater Horizon oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, that occurred when a well, which was in the process of being plugged and temporarily abandoned, suffered a blowout, as, as we're all well aware. Uh, BP was the lessee of the rig, Transocean was the owner of the rig, and had been engaged by BP to provide crew and drilling teams. Halliburton provided cementing and well monitoring services to BP in relation to the temporary abandonment of the well. Both Transocean and Halliburton uh, had purchased liability insurance on the Bermuda form from Chubb. There was a, a claim by Halliburton against Chubb under the policy, which was disputed. The form provided for arbitration. Uh, the seat uh, was London and uh, English law applied. Uh, the uh, arbitration clause provided for two party appointed arbitrators and a third to be appointed by the High Court in default of agreement. Uh, of course, the party uh, appointees could not agree on the on the chairperson uh, and that led to a contested application in the High Court. Uh, Mr Justice Flo, 
uh, appointed, uh, as we now, uh, everybody now knows, uh, Mr. Ken Rockerson as chair. Uh, and of course, Mr. Rockerson was one of Chubb's uh, preferred candidates. At the time of his appointment, uh, Mr. Rockerson Mr. disclosed numerous previous appointments by Chubb and also his existing involvement in two arbitrations in which Chubb was a party. However, he did not subsequently disclose two later appointments. Uh, the first was an appointment by Chubb itself in another Deepwater Horizon reference. Uh, the second was a further appointment in, in another Deepwater Horizon reference. And to try to um, uh, make all of this clear, I put it into a table, which um, hopefully you can see on the screen, uh, tells you, indicates in relation to the three references, the first reference being, of course, the, the reference in Halliburton and Chubb itself, and the other two subsequent references, which um, Mr. Rockinson did not make any disclosure in relation to. The first one, obviously, the appointing party was the court, but as I say, uh, Mr. Rockerson was Chubb's preferred candidate. The disclosure in, in, in relation to, uh, that Mr. Rockerson made upon that appointment was that he was acting as arbitrator in several arbitration, in arbitrations to which Chubb was a party uh, and two pending references in which Chubb was involved. In the second reference, the appointing party was Chubb itself. The claimant there was Transocean. And um, in that reference, Mr. Rockerson disclosed the fact of reference number one uh, and the others that had also been disclosed to Halliburton in ref reference number one. But he did not disclose to Halliburton in reference number one that he was appointed in reference number two. Uh, in the third reference, that was a joint appointment between Transocean and a third party insurer, not, not Chubb. But um, <clears throat> again, Mr. Rockinson did not disclose to Halliburton in reference number one, the fact of the appointment in reference number three. So hopefully that makes some sense of where, where the parties were. Uh, upon finding out about the subsequent appointments, Halliburton made an application uh, to the court under section 24.1a of the Arbitration Act. Um, before doing so, of course, it wrote to uh, Mr. Rockerson and um, raised the issue. And Mr. Rockerson's uh, position in response to the parties was effectively as follows. He, had set, he, he started, his starting point was that there was no obligation to disclose the appointments under the IBA guidelines. However, he acknowledged that it would certainly have been prudent to make the disclosure and he apologised for not having done so. Uh, and on that basis, he offered to resign. Uh, the next bit of correspondence was from Chubb, which, uh, in which they objected to his resignation because they said it would cause delay and, unwa and wasted costs. Uh, and in particular, the fact that a hearing was uh, coming up quickly. Uh, Mr. Rockinson then replied again saying, well, making clear that he'd not learnt anything in the other two references about the incident that wasn't already public knowledge. He recognised the fundamental importance of the party's confidence in the tribunal and the chairman. And he uh, said that if he could decide the matter in his own self-interest, he would resign. So on that basis, he invited the parties to agree a replacement chair that, who would have been available for the hearing. Obviously, there was no such agreement and uh, Halliburton then sought the order to remove um, Ms. Rockinson as arbitrator under section 24. Uh, it's worth noting that <clears throat> in the course of these uh, uh, proceedings in the High Court, Chubb released to Halliburton its defences in the second reference, and that revealed that the, there was a substantial similarity between the defences in references one and two. And we'll come back to that later in the context of the, the wider relevance to um, arbitrating energy disputes uh, at the end of the talk. Just to remind ourselves <clears throat> what uh, section 24 of the Arbitration Act says, uh, that reflects the common law test for apparent bias. That's whether the fair-minded and informed observer, having considered the facts, would conclude that there was a real possibility that the tribunal was biased. And of course, uh, that's an objective test for bias, taking a balanced and detached approach having taken the trouble to be informed of all matters 
that are relevant. I think in the Supreme Court, Lord Hodge put it something like, um, the, the, the informed observer takes the time to read the, the text and not just the headnote. In February 2017, the High Court dismissed the application to remove Mr. Rockinson. Uh, it did so on the basis that there were no uh, justifiable concerns uh, regarding the acceptance of appointments in references two and three. And so on that basis, the court held there was nothing to be disclosed. Uh, and it's worth mentioning as well that the court expressly rejected the complaints that were made regarding the manner of Mr. Rockinson's response to the challenge. What happened next in the story, there was an, the arbitration hearing uh, in reference number one took place in January and February 2017. And um, the, the, there were preliminary issue references in, in F, references two and three that were then decided in favour of Chubb and the other insurer that brought those references to an end in March 2017. So references two and three uh, were uh, no longer active after March 2017. In December 2017, the tribunal issued its award on the merits in Chubb's favour, in reference number one. However, uh, Halliburton's nominated arbitrator, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Professor Park, issued a separate a note of separate observations in which he said that he could not join in the award due to what he called profound disquiet about the arbitration's fairness. And the effect of that uh, was that the, uh, the award was rendered as a majority award. And I've put on the slide there for you, I, I won't read it out, um, but the text of, um, part, part of the text of the separate observations. And of course, um, it's a rather um, unusual thing to happen. So um, Halliburton then appealed uh, to the Court of Appeal. Uh, judgment in 2018, uh, in which uh, the Court of Appeal dismissed the appeal. It held um, that as a matter of good practice in international arbitration, the, the, there should be disclosure where there was any concern. And the court held that given the overlap between the references, Mr. Rockerson should have disclosed. So the Court of Appeal held there was a duty to, to disclose. However, the court went on to hold that there was no real possibility of bias on the facts objectively judged. And in particular, <clears throat> the court had reference to um, the following factors. First of all, it said the fact of multiple appointments did not of itself justify an inference of apparent bias. Uh, the court also noted that the failure was accidental uh, and not deliberate. Uh, the court went on to note that there was actually a limited degree of overlap between the references. Uh, and finally, the court noted that no criticism could, could be made of Mr. Rockinson's conduct. And uh, I think that last point is quite significant in the context of um, an exercise of deciding uh, issues such as apparent bias. So, uh, the hearing in the Supreme Court took place in November 2019, and of course we all know uh, we had to wait a year until November 2020 to find out the, the judgment of, of the Supreme Court. Um, of course, we now know that the Supreme Court dismissed uh, the appeal. The starting point um, that the court took was uh, Section 33 of the Arbitration Act and the general duty of the tribunal. And of course, the general duty is to act fairly and impartially as between the parties giving each party a reasonable opportunity of putting his case and deciding uh, and dealing with that of his opponent. So that, that's the core principle uh, from which um, the, the principles on, on the appeal uh, were derived. The Supreme Court next considered whether there was actually a legal duty of disclosure in English law. And um, the Supreme Court agreed with the Court of Appeal that there was. The court held that it was clear from the statutory duty to act fairly and impartially under section 33 of the Arbitration Act. And uh, that was a, a natural uh, part and parcel of that duty to act fairly. Uh, 
the court went on, uh, the English law duty of disclosure requires multiple appointments involving the same or overlapping subject matter to be disclosed in the absence of contrary agreement. And the court held that includes circumstances such as that present case uh, in a field of arbitration in which multiple appointments do occur, but where there is no common understanding that disclosure is not required. And, and that position can be contrasted with the position in maritime and sports and commodities arbitrations, um, as explained by the interveners, including the LMAA, uh, because of course, in, in such arbitrations, it's an accepted feature that arbitrators will act in multiple arbitrations. And, and the fact of them doing so does not call into question their fairness or impartiality. So the Supreme Court held that Mr. Rockinson should have disclosed the appointments in reference to, and the failure to do so was a breach of that duty to disclose. However, on the facts of the particular case, and of course the judgment running to some 61 pages goes into a lot of detail of the surrounding um, uh, facts of the particular case and the different approaches under different rules and in different jurisdictions. Uh, but on the facts of this case, and in particular the explanation of the failure that Mr. Rockinson had given to the parties by the date of the hearing to remove him, which was the relevant date, the objective bias for, uh, test for bias was not satisfied. And the Supreme Court held that the fair-minded observer would not have concluded that there was a real possibility of bias despite Mr. Rockinson's non-disclosure and, and on that basis dismissed the appeal, perhaps somewhat to the surprise of, of certain um, observers. Uh, there are a few points to note about the, um, the case of Halliburton generally, the Supreme Court uh, decision. The first, of course, is to note that it uh, was a case in which uh, English law applied and uh, the seat was a London seat. There were no institutional rules applicable. Uh, so um, it, it was in that sense a relatively narrow uh, decision in terms of its implication. It only applies uh, <clears throat> where English law applies and there's a London seat and there are no institutional rules applicable. And uh, it's worth reminding ourselves at that point, of course, that the test in, in English law for bias is objective. And by contrast, arbitral, various arbitral codes objects, uh, uh, adopt a, a subjective test. So, for example, IBA guidelines, ICC rules and LCIA rules all focus on the perceptions of the parties themselves. And that, of course, is a fundamental difference. The other point, uh, which is a, a, an important point to note, um, is that the, the issue that the Supreme Court grappled with in that case was the appointment of an arbitrator in multiple references involving the same or overlapping subject matter. It, it was not a case which concerned repeat appointments generally. It, it, it only concerned uh, appointments where the subject matter overlaps. So for those two fairly key reasons, um, it can be said that the Supreme Court decision is, is a relatively narrow decision. However, it, it is um, worth mentioning that, uh, in particular, the interveners, such as the LCIA, uh, said that the Court of Appeal decision had not given sufficient weight to international norms in making its decision. Uh, and it's true to say, of course, that, that that was a fairly widely held view and criticism of the, the Court of Appeal decision. And the Supreme Court recognised that the, although it was an English law uh, case and the common law objective test applied, that had to be applied, the court said, with regard to the particular characteristics of international arbitration. Uh, and that's paragraph 69 of, of Lord Hodge's judgment. And uh, in particular, Lord Hodge uh, said that the fair-minded observer should be taken to have knowledge of what he called the debate between uh, within the international community as to the precise role of the party appointed arbitrator. So of course this whole debate as to whether a party appointed arbitrator, the degree to which a party appointed arbitrator can be expected to be entirely impartial 
or, or might uh, be expected to lean in a particular direction. That, that the fact that there is a debate about that within the international community is something that the fair-minded observer should be taken to have knowledge of. And um, as I say, uh, it's worth reminding ourselves that of course the test is objective, arbitral codes uh, adopt, adopt a, a subjective test. So of course in a different case uh, where say uh, the ICC rules apply or the LCIA rules apply, uh, the focus of the court would be very different and of course they would be looking at the perceptions of the parties themselves. So um, that, that is a fundamental difference um, I would suggest. So the question then is for what is the relevance of this to energy uh, related arbitrations? What are the implications of the decision in relation to arbitrations uh, that arise in the context of energy disputes? Well there's two broad areas really where, <clears throat> where the decision clearly has, has, has relevance. The first is cases such as uh, Halliburton itself, where disputes arise out of the same incident, such as deep water, the Deepwater Horizon incident. However, there is a, a second area uh, <clears throat> where the, the decision has relevance, and that's to disputes that don't arise out of the same incident, but nevertheless could be said to involve the same subject matter. Uh, as to the first area, it's clear that such cases there will be a duty to disclose multiple appointments. On the facts of a particular case, uh, in accordance with the Supreme Court decision, there may well not be a breach or, or, or a breach or not a breach in doing so. But the decision has clear uh, significance for parties considering appointing the same arbitrator in multiple references relevant to the same incident, which we, we know happens uh, many times and of course happened uh, numerous times in relation to the Deepwater Horizon instance itself. But the second potentially much wider significance in the context of arbitrations where they could be argued to have overlapping subject matter is, uh, I would suggest, <clears throat> of more, of potentially more, more interest. Um, th the best way to illustrate that may be to take an example um, and taking the uh, MT Hoggard Eon Robin rig litigation. Uh, which concerned the offshore wind farms built in, in the Solway Firth. Um, I'll just put up a picture while you, <laughs> while you listen to me. No doubt everyone will be familiar with the decision of the Supreme Court in this case, it's well known. Um, <clears throat> but a very brief recap. Of course, that dispute concerned a contract for the design and insta installation of offshore wind farms. Uh, in relation to the design of the foundations, MTH was contractually obliged to comply with the offshore standard DNV uh, J101. Uh, it also had a fitness for purpose obligation uh, and within the technical requirements um, forming part of the contract, obligations to ensure a design life of 20 years. Now, as we all know, uh, at, the, at the time, J101 included an error in the um, uh, equation, the, the relevant calculation uh, that concerned the design of the grouted connections connecting the monopiles to the uh, transition piece. MTH carried out the design in accordance with J101, obviously using the erroneous calculation. And of course, upon completion of the, the two wind farms, uh, the Robin Rig uh, in 2009, uh, only months later, a serious problem came to light at another wind farm that had also been designed using J101. And of course, we know the connection started to fail. Uh, and uh, as a result, substantial remedial works were needed to solve the problem. But the key dispute was, well, whose responsibility uh, were those remedial works? And uh, in, uh, uh, in the Eon and MT Hoggard case, the Supreme Court, as we know, held that MTH was responsible for the costs of remedial works, notwithstanding that its design complied with J101 as the contract required it. And of course, that was because it had the obligation to achieve a design that would nevertheless last for 20 years, which its design didn't do. And um, the facts of the Robin Rigg case <clears throat> make clear that numerous disputes, uh, plainly, uh, in particular, one can see as, as a result of the fact that the issue actually arose on a, a completely uh, separate wind farm. Um, but numerous disputes would have arisen as a result of the issue with J101. And no doubt, all such cases could be said and probably would be said to concern the same or overlapping subject matter. That's the design of the foundations, 
um, the, the J101 code itself uh, and related questions of contractual interpretation. And in such cases, it's, it, it's no doubt attractive for a party to appoint an arbitrator in multiple references where the views of that arbitrator as to the correct interpretation of the contract and liability uh, in, in the circumstances are, are going to favour its particular case. Um, that, I think, is a particularly interesting uh, area and, and goes well beyond the obvious uh, in, uh, application of Halliburton and Chubb simply to disputes that arise out of the same incident. And um, that possibility of a much broader application to disputes that um, concern subject matter, i.e. Uh, pieces of, of technical design, uh, the interpretation of a code, um, standard form contracts, that sort of thing, where the issue ultimately that is the problem is the same, albeit it relates to a separate project, uh, it, I think is, is a much more interesting and potentially much more significant um, uh, impact of that of the Supreme Court's decision. Because of course Halliburton makes clear that in such cases uh, disclosure of those multiple appointments is uh, likely to be required. Thank you very much for listening. I will now stop sharing and shift back to Lucy. Thank you. Thanks very much, James. Um, do submit your questions in the chat box. I can see we've got two come in. Um, I'm going to just share my screen now and um, get started. Um, managing change. Um, so I've got four topics that I'm going to cover um, in this talk and before I properly kick off I just want to make clear how I've approached um, my slides. My intention is that when you go back to these slides after the talk you will have uh, to hand all the relevant references and the text that you need so that if you're looking at one of these issues subsequently you will be able to find what you need to know but uh, don't worry it's not going to be one of those awful talks where I just read out what's written on the slide and you don't need to read everything on the slide to understand what I'm saying um, and I've also uh, focused on uh, the position under FIDIC logic and the SAJ being um, the contracts that obviously most commonly crop up in energy projects. So first of all, requirements for instructions. Um, I'm going to start with um, instructions oral or in writing. And um, I've just set out on the slide what the relevant requirements are for instructions being in writing in the, in the three standard forms. And for obvious reasons of clarity and certainty, they all, the default position under all the forms is that instructions should be in writing in the first instance. It's only logic that expressly recognises the practical reality that quite often instructions are given orally in the first instance. And the logic provisions make express what sensible parties do in any event, which is to confirm an instruction given orally uh, in writing. Um, none of the forms provide for a specific format for the writing, which means that minutes of meetings, emails, etc., can all be um, instructions in writing, unless you've got one of those contracts that specifically defines the forms of writing that are acceptable. And sometimes those, uh, those types of clauses can exclude emails still to this day, which means that sometimes you have to be a bit careful with, with emails. And the test for whether any given document that you're trying to rely on as an instruction is an instruction will be whether the document is sufficiently clear to amount to an instruction under the contract. And there is a helpful authority on that. It is Ramsey Jay's case called Blue Water, which I'm gonna come on to discuss in a bit more detail um, later on in this talk. So what then happens um, if the instruction is oral or it's oral and not confirmed in writing under logic? Now, none of these forms make writing a condition, they expressly make writing a condition precedent to the validity of the instruction. So in principle, it must be that an oral instruction can, can be valid. There is a, um, a, a tweak or maybe a wrinkle um, to that, uh, that point, which is worth bearing in mind since the decision in the Rock Advertising case um, in 2018, um, which as everyone listening will know, the Supreme Court held that um, 
clauses that prohibited oral variations to the contract were effective and did, did stop people orally agreeing changes. Um, Logic contains a no oral variation clause in its entire agreement, clause 34, um, which says no amendments to the contract shall be, effect, shall be effective unless evidenced in writing and signed. But that clause, the entire agreement clause and no oral, no, no oral variation clauses generally um, are dealing with variations to the contract rather than variations under the contract. And it's certainly the case that, that Rock was also about variations to the contract. Um, so it's probably the case that neither clause 34 um, of logic or the decision in Rock makes no difference to the principle that change instructions under a contract which are given orally are, are, are valid. Um, but there might be a difference here between the situation under FIDIC and logic and the, and the position under SAJ, which as you'll see from the slide requires that the specs can be modified or changed by the written agreement of the parties here too. Um, but the, which, which obviously um, the, the requirement for agreement is different to um, a power to instruct changes under the contract. Um, and so I can see that the ROC, uh, the ROC decision might have more application to um, the potential for an oral agreement under the SAJ. However, as I will come on to discuss in a moment, because of the way change is dealt with under the SAJ, it's probably less likely to arise in practice in a shipbuilding contract than it is under the engineering, the engineering contracts. Um, there, there can be other situations where um, requirements are imposed on the um, on the instructions by the contracts and this this um, slide is really about the situation where the contract makes a particular format for the instruction a condition precedent to its validity um, so sometimes you'll see a requirement for there to be a signature on instruction or the instruction to come from a specific person in writing um, either for the instruction to be valid at all or for it to be treated as a change under the contract. And the question arises in those cases, what happens if the employer refuses to comply with such a requirement, either because it disagrees that the instruction is a change or because it doesn't consider that the matter requires an instruction at all. Now, assuming that you've actually got a problem in this situation, which as I say, only really arises if the contract itself makes the requirement a condition precedent, there are two useful cases um, that I've, I've, I've put on the slide. Um, Swallow Falls and Monaco Yachting um, is a Court of Appeal case in 2014, which was a shipbuilding contract where payment was due on the achievement of milestones, but only if um, the, uh, the, the certificate saying that the milestone had been achieved was countersigned by the employer. And what was happening was that even though the milestone had in fact been achieved, the employer was refusing to countersign. And the Court of Appeal held that in that kind of situation, the implied term of cooperation um, operated so as to effectively compel the employer to, to countersign or to be treated as having countersigned, although obviously factually it had not, but the Court of Appeal treated the counter signature as having, give, having been given because um, otherwise the employer was going to be in breach of this implied term. And there's another case, an old case, um, another Court of Appeal case called Brody, back in 1919. And this is a useful case to have up your sleeve because um, it's, a, it's a case about um, a situation where the employer's engineer was required by the contract to issue um, variation orders in writing. And he wouldn't do it because he believed, honestly, that there was no variation. Um, he was wrong, but that's what he honestly believed. So it got to uh, went through an arbitration, and it went. It was appealed to um, the English courts, and went up to the House of Lords. And sorry, the House of Lords, yes, not the not the Court of Appeal, the House of Lords. Um, and uh, they held by a majority that the end, the arbitrator was entitled to review the actions of the engineer in refusing to order an instruction, and the findings of the tribunal would take the place of or supply the want of the written instruction, even though that was a condition precedent to the variation being treated as a variation under the contract. So those two cases are useful in a situation where um, you've got an employer who's trying to pick and choose um, whether a change is treated as a, as, a, as a variation or not under the contract. 
So uh, moving on to whether the contractor is obliged to comply with instructions under, under any circumstances. Um, now, there's a difference here, an interesting difference in the way change instructions are dealt with under the engineering standard forms and the shipbuilding standard forms. Um, I've put the, I've put the um, relevant provisions up of FIDIC and LOGIC on, on the slide. Um, under both of them, the starting point is that the contractor has got to comply with any instructions given. Under FIDIC, you'll see that there's very limited grounds to object. Um, only on the basis that the instruction doesn't comply with the applicable laws, that it will reduce the safety of the works or that it's technically impossible. And I, I'm quoting from the 2017 version of FIDIC, and you'll see um, from the slide that um, if the contractor thinks that the variation does fall within one of those grounds, then he has to write um, very quickly to the engineer to raise that problem um, and if no notice is given, then the contractor has to comply. Now that in itself is a sort of mini condition precedent to the contractor being able to dispute the variation at all. Um, so logic has a similar regime. Um, the contractor can object if the instruction is legally or physically impossible or creates a hazard to safety. Otherwise, the contractor's got to comply with all of the company's instructions and directions. And um, logic makes explicit the situation that's implicit in FIDIC, that the contractor must go ahead and implement the instruction, even though the amount of any adjustment to the contract price or the schedule of key dates has not been determined. So expressly saying, even if there's a dispute about uh, whether it's a variation at all and how much money or time the contractor is going to get for that variation, He's still, got to, he's still got to go ahead. And in logic, it's worth noting, in addition, that the, um, the company has the right to terminate for default on the part of the contractor. And if the contractor wrongly refused to carry out the instruction, that would be a default. So um, in the logic form, you've got a potential situation where um, the refusal to comply with the instructions could lead to a very serious consequence for the, for the contractor. Under the SAJ and shipbuilding forms generally, there's a different regime um, where the uh, situation, the mechanisms under the contract are different for different, for different kinds of change. So there's, it's divided up into non-compulsory changes and compulsory changes. Non-compulsory changes are the kind of thing you might think of as um, uh, requests by the by the buyer preferences expressed by the buyer and for those effectively they are in practical terms at the option of the builder under shipboarding standard forms so the saj um, says that the builder um, can reject the change if it affects the builder's planning or program in relation to the builder's other commitments and, and that has to that's that's in the builder's judgment so it's a subjective judgment as to whether it has this adverse effect that the clause refers to and secondly that the buyer has to first agree to alterations in the price and the delivery date etc um, before the modifications are carried out so um, essentially under the SAJ the builder has a wide discretion um, and strong powers to get the price and the um, adjustments that he that he wants as a result of any non-compulsory changes. And that regime obviously reflects the commercial reality of vessels being built in a shipyard. Um, changes or delays to one vessel are much more capable of affecting the rest of the yard's business um, than changes or delays are on a, on a traditional um, construction contract. Um, for the compulsory changes, the rules are that the builder has to incorporate them and the buyer has to agree the appropriate adjustments. Now, under the standard form SAJ, that's, those are the rules, but there's no uh, provision for the situation where the, um, the buyer wants the builder to incorporate the change, but they can't agree on the price or the um, effect on the delivery date. And that situation was one of the disputes that arose in, in Adyard uh, back in 2011, 
and uh, it was an amended version of the SAJ, not 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 brilliantly done. Um, didn't it didn't quite all fit together. And the Yard argued in Agile that if the buyer took the inconsistent position that the builder both had to incorporate the change and refused to agree a reasonable price for them, this created a contractual limbo, which amounted to an act of prevention. And that meant the buyer could no longer rely on the delivery date and the extension of time and permissible delay mechanisms. And what Hamlin J uh, did in the case was he looked at um, articles two, five and eight um, as a whole and held in particular that Article 8 was a broad sweep up clause and preferred um, SDMS's interpretation of the contract for the reasons that I've summarised on the on the slide. Effectively, it made the contract work in summary that 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 was what he liked the best. And he he didn't want um, to make a finding that in the obviously foreseeable situation where the parties couldn't agree as to the relevant adjustments to price or time, um, that the contract would effectively collapse completely. And he added um, that where there is ambiguity, the court should lean in favour of a construction that makes the contract work. So, um, in, and, in, and when you actually read the detail of the judgment on this point in Adyard, um, you will see the difficulty that um, Hamlin and Jay was in in making all the bits of the contract fit together and the amount of work he had to do. And um, I'll, I'll just add about Agile that I was in Agile um, being led by Adam Constable um, for the buyer. And in the case, we actually admitted to the judge that the contract didn't quite work and he was going to have to do some um, somersaults. That's, that's how bad it was. Um, he does a nice job in the judgment of making it sound very sensible. Um, and just to um, note on, on, on Adyard, um, there was also discussion about um, an amended uh, part of Article 8 that included a condition precedent, a uh, notice condition precedent. And the Hamlin's decision involved construing the notice regime in Article 8.2 as applicable to all modifications under the contract, uh, not just the causes of delay mentioned in Article 8.1. And I'm noting that now because it's, that's going to come up again uh, later in this talk. Um, so the next point I want to talk about is, um, is notice. And what I'm going to do here is go through the relevant authorities. And um, I'm very much hoping that at the end of it, neither uh, anyone listening nor I will have to look them up again. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, the the old Bremer case um, in the House of Lords in 1978. Um, it's quite an odd case, Bremer. It's about a chain of supply contracts and has quite it has quite odd facts. Um, so what I've done in these slides is I've set out what the court said about the principle applicable to a notice condition precedent. And on the right hand side of the slide, I've set out what the clause was. So you don't have to go tracking through the authorities to find whether your clause is similar to the clause in the in the case. Um, so there's nothing surprising about the principles that are stated uh, by Lord Wilberforce in Bremer as applicable to deciding whether a clause is a condition precedent, except perhaps how modern they are. Um, it's interesting that a great judge back in 1978 was saying that ordinary principles apply and there's nothing special about notice provisions in commercial contracts. Um, and on the, uh, the clause itself, he found that the, the House of Lords found it wasn't a condition precedent and it effectively just construed the words of the clause. Um, there's an interesting comment on the without delay wording. Um, it was held to be an obligation, breach of which could give rise to damages, but it wasn't a condition precedent. And it was noted that the lack of a specific time period um, meant that it was less likely to be a condition precedent because it wasn't so specific. And an obligation to do things without delay comes up in some of the standard forms. So it's worth it's worth noting that down. Um, I've just put multiplex in, although it's not really a notice case, it's really a prevention principle case because it has a nice clear uh, statement in it from um, Jackson Jay, as he then was, um, about the purpose of notice provisions, uh, which as uh, we all know, is um, it, it does have a, a, a practical, uh, valuable point for the employer so that he can investigate matters while they're still current and the employer knows what's going on in the project. Um, the next case in chronological order is, is Steria. And I this, this is an interesting case, Steria, because it's often referred to 
um, in discussion of the notice cases as an anomaly, because it said that the finding in Steria that the clause in question was a condition precedent is outside the normal run of cases, because in Steria there wasn't an express statement of the consequences of failing to um, serve the notice. But I would um, suggest that on analysis, um, Steria isn't as far outside the other authorities as it seems to be. Um, the principle stated in Steria is obviously perfectly normal and obviously correct. Um, the more draconian a clause, the clearer it has to be. Um, and so it must be right to say that if there's genuine ambiguity as to whether the notification is a condition precedent, then, then you shouldn't construe it as a condition precedent. Um, that, that must be correct. But the comments, when you actually look at the comments of the judge on the, on the clause itself, I think that they are in fact more within the general run of the authorities than you might think. The clause did say, had a proviso wording in it, it had a, in any such case provided that the subcontractor will have given the notice. And the judge held that that phrase provided that was a was clear in its meaning. He says in terms that the notification can operate as a condition precedent, even though it doesn't contain an express warning as to consequences. But the clause makes clear in ordinary language that the right to the extension of time depends on notice, and and that's enough. So, um, I, I do I do. Um, emphasize the reliance that the judge put on the on the proviso wording in stereo. Um, the next case, gear. Um, you will see in gear that in fact a very similar approach was taken by Aikenhead J. Now gear is um is actually a very funny case um, so far as you ever do get funny get humor in, in this kind of issue because um, although you'll see on the right hand side of this slide, I've highlighted the words, it shall be a condition precedent to the contractor's entitlement under this clause 4.21.1. What that looks like is an absolutely classic drafting of a condition precedent clause, which says in terms what the consequence will be and uses absolutely clear wording to, um, to set out how important this, this proviso is. But unfortunately, the clause as drafted was effectively meaningless and didn't make sense because no entitlement actually arose under clause 4.21.1. So uh, the parties, um, obviously the contractor was arguing that that meant the whole thing just fell to bits because uh, it, it, it was a meaningless clause. What the employer did was rely on the earlier words in the clause. Um, and Aikenhead J said the ordinary principles of contractual construction apply, um, again, it's fairly well established by now. And on the clause in dispute, he found it was a condition precedent. And the first point bullet point I've put on the left hand side of the slide, I think is worth emphasizing. He said the making of the written application was the trigger and thus an overall precondition to entitlement. And that was a reference to the if the trade contractor makes a written application. And he goes back to uh, Aikenhead J has quite a long discussion in the judgment about the old London Borough and, um, of Merton and Leach case, where there were if clauses in, in a contract, which the judge in, in Merton found were preconditions. So you've got a situation in some of these cases where before you even get to whether the notice condition precedent kicks in, you have, a, you have a, an if clause that means that before you start looking at the notice, you have to look at whether the uh, trigger for the entire clause has been met. So the judge said that you had to make the written application and that was the first part of the requirements under this clause in gear. And he also said specifically that wording such as provided always is often the strongest sign that the parties intend there to be a condition precedent. And that's obviously consistent with um, the uh, stereo discussion. And uh, so what he did was he said Aikenhead found that the earlier wording, wording was uh, sufficiently strong and he dealt with the uh, meaningless point um, by saying that the last part of the clause was superfluous because the earlier parts were sufficient to establish the, the condition precedent. Um, so that was, that was gear. 
And then the next one, which is actually on Fiddick itself, um, is Obruscon um, in 2014, another case of Akerhead Jays. And um, everyone will be aware that um, leading counsel for the um, for the contractor, um, Andrew White QC, conceded in the case um, that the notice provision in FIDIC was a condition precedent um, by reason of the wording of, the, of that clause. And Aiken Head J said that he was right to make that, that make that concession. The issue in the case was what was the trigger for having to give the notice? And you'll see from the right hand side of the slide that the clause said that the notice had to be given as soon as practicable and not later than 28 days after the contractor became aware or should have become aware of the event or circumstance. So the argument in Obruscon was all about what um, event or circumstance meant and when would the contractor become aware or should become aware of that event or circumstance. And what Aikenhead J said was that the trigger should be construed reasonably broadly, the trigger word should be construed reasonably broadly, given its serious effect on what could otherwise be good claims. And this, this approach does reflect something that um, you do see in the in all of the authorities, um, either expressly or impliedly, and those listening will no doubt have experienced in practice, the desire of the courts or the tribunals to not to shut out good claims by the contractor uh, through a procedural bar. And so in Obruscon, the words of the contract um, which set up the condition precedent were... Uh, with the consequence were absolutely crystal clear. They're the ones on the bottom right of the of the slide. Um, and they were so clear that it was conceded they were a condition precedent. What the judge then did was construe the trigger broadly, giving the contractor the maximum leeway in when the 28 days uh, started effectively. So he said uh, notice was only required once there actually was delay of which the contractor was aware or should have been aware. And the event or circumstance could mean either the incident causing delay or the delay which results or inevitably will result from that incident. And he went on to comment that no particular form was called for by the, by the, by the contract. So the clause permitted any kind of notice in writing um, as long as it was in writing and described the event or circumstance relied on. So he did two things. He construed the trigger broadly and he also made, uh, made it clear that pretty much any uh, form of written notice would, would be good enough. And you see this kind of approach again in The Golden Exquisite, um, another case decided just a few months after Obras gone by uh, Legat J, as he then was. And The Golden Exquisite involves a fiendish analysis of an amended version of the SAJ and the interlocking definitions of permissible and non-permissible delay and the extension of time regime under the SAJ. Um, it genuinely wet tower around the head stuff. But luckily, the bits on the condition precedent are, are less complicated. Um, and I've uh, recited the clause on, on the slide. Um, and um, again, the um, express, the, the, the SAJ uh, standard form doesn't include a, a condition precedent notification requirement. So the second paragraph, um, of the clause was added by amendment as it as it often is um, and it, again there was no dispute in the golden exquisite that that was a condition precedent so that the, you had to serve the notice um, to get relief but the question was what relief was the clause talking about um, so on in terms of the principles the judge emphasizes again the importance of receipt of notice to the employer or, or buyer um, this is obviously particularly important in shipbuilding cases because there are termination rights which on the face of it arise as soon as the delivery date is not met and if the employer if the buyer is not aware that he might be facing an extension of time claim um, or permissible delay claim then he might find himself in a situation where he's unlawfully terminated without knowing that, that there was even a potential for that to, to happen so there's a particular so under shipbuilding standard forms there's a particularly uh, this, the notice requirement itself is particularly of practical importance, even more so than in um, other other engineering contracts. Um, so the the finding in the case was that any relief claimed referred to exemption from liability for delay as well as an extension to the delivery date. However, 
the causes of delay caught by the by the clause which was as i say was article 82 as amended were only those in article 81 and that is a different conclusion to the exact same argument that arose in Adyard, obviously on a different a different set of amendments to the SAJ, um, where Adyard, um, where what Hamlin J did was treat the notice provision in Article 82 as broadly catching all of the possible causes of delay under the contract, not just ones in Article 81, but ones in Article 5 as well. Um, and Agile was cited in the Golden Exquisite and Leggett doesn't actually deal with the difference of opinion, um, although he does specifically agree with Hamlin J that uh, you should construe contracts to make them work and it would be surprising if the parties were left in a contractual limbo. Um, now, obviously, the results of these cases is going to be heavily dependent on the precise terms of the contract in every case, and it's often it's also often the position that the wording of the condition precedent clause itself is drafted very, very widely. So perhaps it's unlikely that the specific problem in the Golden Explicit will come up again. Um, just to finish on this point, I have summarised uh, in a rather dense slide, I apologise for this, um, the, the relevant position under the contracts um, it's worth noting FIDIC 2017 um, includes the same wording as was discussed in Obruscon. So you've got a useful guide in Obruscon for how that works. The new version of uh, FIDIC, the 2017 version, adds in um, the, uh, the a requirement um, after clause 20.2 in 20.2.2 .2 that the engineer now has to serve a notice if he thinks the contractor's notice of claim is out of time. If the engineer doesn't serve a notice, then the contractor's notice of claim is deemed to be a good notice. And then FIDIC has, um, as everybody will, I'm sure be familiar, uh, a detailed, not to say slightly torturous claims process under clause 20. And there's some extra, um, I think more onerous obligations on the contractor in the 2017 version, um, which include a provision in the red book which used to only be in the gold book, which deals with where there's a dispute as to whether the original notice of claim is valid or not. The idea being that parties have given the requisite notices on this point um, as envisaged under clause 20.2.2. And that gives the engineer a discretion to take into account the lateness and whether it prejudices the receiving party. And I'm gonna talk about um, clauses that have discretion in them uh, in just a moment. So uh, bear that in mind that FIDIC has introduced a discretion procedure further down the line where there's a dispute about the validity of the notice. Um, the SAJ, as unamended in the, in the original standard form, doesn't have a precondition precedent at all, um, using people add express wording as in Adyard and in Golden Exquisite. Um, in logic, uh, again, note the wording, you've got a requirement for a notice, um, and then you've got a situation where the contractor at the sole discretion of the company forfeits any right to receive such variations. And that brings me neatly on to my last topic and my last case, which is about discretion clauses like the ones that are now in FIDIC 2017 and, uh, and are in the logic, uh, logic, logic standard form. Um, in blue water, there was an amended version of logic, which had the relevant sole discretion wording in it. And what Ramsey J said was that the forfeiture provisions were subject to the important qualification that the right shall be forfeit at the sole discretion of blue water. And he said this brought into play the general law applying to contractual provisions, allowing for one party to be given a discretion as set out in Sokoma. And that meant that the, that the exercise of the discretion by the employer was limited as a matter of necessary implication by the need for the absence of arbitrariness, capriciousness, perversity and irrationality. And then he goes on to comment about the purpose of notice provisions. He says it's important so that Blue Water has information in a timely manner and so that it can properly assess the adjustments that might be needed to the uh, contract price or to the delivery date. And he says the absence of information given at a particular time may have no effect on those adjustments. If so, it would be an abuse for Blue Water to reject the variation. So if you can find anything in your contract which um, allows the employer a discretion, contrary to what you might expect, 
that actually gives the contractor probably more rights than if there was no discretion in the contract at all because the uh, employer doesn't have any more the just the, the um, jurisdiction just to do whatever whatever it wants so that is the last that's the last slide from me i will unscreen share and hand over to sam who i can see is ready amazing Hi. thank you um, so I'm going to now attempt to share my screen. Hopefully that's it. So I'm talking about developments in the law relating to green energy projects. The first point to make is, of course, at root of many of the cases in relation to green energy projects are contractual disputes and uh, one contract dispute, as we've already seen, uh, the interpretation of the contract is, is universal. Uh, whether it's energy, green energy, construction, or whatever else. So I'm not overstating my case when I argue that there are some particular characteristics of the developing case law in this sector, uh, this um, developing green energy sector that uh, warrant particular consideration. Um, there's no doubt that the green energy sector is a growth area it's an exciting time, and I would suggest exciting subject matter. Just look at this photograph. Um, Southwick State Solar Farm in Hampshire, a 48 megawatt solar park. Uh, when it was connected to the grid in 2015, it was the largest single solar farm in the UK, billed as the greenest ever solar farm construction. The scale is impressive. It generates enough electricity to supply approximately 14,500 homes. Um, uh, and that's not it in terms of development as I'll come on to. Uh, but I want to define the parameters of my talk. What do I mean here by green energy? Green renewables energy projects includes wind farms, both onshore and offshore, solar farms, biomass using renewable energy sources, and nuclear, although the caveat would be nuclear contracts, as you will know, um, invariably, almost invariably, contain private dispute resolution clauses. You simply don't see uh, contractual disputes relating to nuclear projects in the courts. I've listed for your convenience uh, all the cases I'm going to refer to in my talk. And they concern an array of subject matter, have ant concerns, biomethane for injection into the national gas network, Solaria is concerned with the supply of solar panels, Gwint y Moore, my Welsh isn't very good I'm afraid, uh, but that concerns the corrosion of cables connecting uh, to the grid, the offshore wind, uh, an offshore wind farm, Biosol renewables, a case um, handed down uh, last week, concerns uh, the supply of biomass oil, boilers fueled by wood chip. Toucan Energy and Worsol, a case I'll explain in a mo. Uh, it concerns 15 UK solar wind farms. And Equitix and Veolia uh, it is also concerned with the construction of a biomass energy plant. Um, so the themes that I think arise are, uh, first of all, legal challenges associated with um, government investments and incentives. That's a particularity of the green energy sector. So there's challenges to government on how they apply or disapply their investment and incentive policies. And then um, uh, uh, an interesting facet of this is how government incentive payments are then worked through the contractual arrangements between parties. Uh, those are characteristics of cases in this area. Secondly, flawed asset claims. Um, often these sorts of projects are bought and sold as packages in varying stages of development with warranties as to quality and performance. And sometimes those assets are not as billed hence flawed asset claims. Thirdly, and perhaps more typically for energy disputes more generally, uh, there's the contractual standards and in particular the meaning of fitness for 
an application of the fitness for purpose obligation. That, that as I say, is perhaps more classic, classical contractual disputes. Thirdly, there's the types of defects uh, that are particular to the developing green energy in industry. And then fifthly, uh, dispute resolution provisions. So going to my first theme for green energy disputes, legal challenges associated with government policy, uh, always concerning um, investment and incentives. The existence of disputes is simply reflective in my submission of the amount of investment and money being thrown around in this sector at the moment. One characteristic of these cases that I've listed on this slide is the scope and extent of the argument uh, and the basis, the legal basis deployed by the legal teams imaginatively in favor of their clients. Um, the first one is Havant, Biogas and Ofgem. Um, this was a challenge associated with the refusal of a grant of a subsidy, a judicial review of Ofgem's decision to reject four single purpose vehicles applications to participate in uh, the renewable heat incentive green energy subsidy scheme, something we'll become familiar with as we go through some of these cases. The SPVs were producers of biomethane for injection, meaning that the biomethane was uh, intended to be suitable for injection into and conveyance through the national gas network and from there into homes. Participation in the RHI scheme attracts a high level of subsidy, making the enterprise very much worthwhile. The applicants, as I say, these four SPVs argued that Ofgem had been wrong to refuse to register them as producers of biomethane for injection. And then also that the decision of uh, 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 someone called the Statutory Review Officer, SRO, upholding Ofgem's decision was itself undermined by public law errors. Uh, Mr. Justice Fordham, uh, agreed and ordered the process to start again. And so Ofgem have to consider the applications for these four SP, by these four SPVs de novo. And we have yet to see how that will uh, turn out, whether they get access to this very uh, meaty RHI incentive scheme. The second um, case is called Solaria Energy and the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy. This was a challenge associated this time with the removal of a subsidy. Solaria was a supplier of solar panels and what they were uh, appealing against to the Court of Appeal was the striking out of its claim against the government for breach of its rights under the European Convention of Human Rights, Protocol 1, Article 1, incorporated into English law by the Human Rights Act, concerning as you may know, the peaceful enjoyment of possessions, that no one shall be deprived of his possessions, her possessions, except in the public interest. The claim in this case arose from uh, an October 2011 proposal by the government to reduce the subsidies payable under the feed-in tariff scheme for certain solar panels. And had the proposal been implemented, it would have been lawful, unlawful, as determined by the Court of Appeal in a case called Brea and the Department of Energy and Climate Change. Three months before the proposal was published, the supplier, the uh, uh, appellant, had entered into a subcontract for the supply of panels. Its claim was that the proposal, uh, wrongful proposal, as we know from Briar, then forced um, it, the suppliers, to reduce its price under the contract. And so in December 2018, piggybacking on the decision in Briar, Solaria issued a claim under Protocol 1, Article 1, seeking compensation from the government on the basis that it had interfered with its rights under the subcontract uh, uh, that was valued by reference to lost marketable goodwill. The Court of Appeal upheld the striking out of the claim, but only on limitation grounds, 
the claim had been issued almost five years after the expiry of the one year limitation period uh, permitted by the Human Rights Act, and that it would not be equitable within the extension the provision in the Human Rights Act to allow it to proceed after such a delay. In principle, however, perhaps surprisingly, uh, the Court of Appeal accepted that the supplier's subcontract was a possession and, and that therefore wrongful interference by the government with the performance of the subcontract might trigger a Protocol 1, Article 1 claim. Uh, as I say, an imaginative use of the law in, um, in, 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 in putting forward these claims. The third case is uh, Biosol Renewables and Lovering and Others, uh, judgment of His Honour Judge Kaiser, QC sitting in Cardiff as a High Court judge. Among other, other matters, this claim concerned, claimed by the purchaser of biomass boilers, that the boilers supplied were oversized and therefore failed to make the most of our old friend, the Renewable Health Heat Incentive Scheme. Um, so Biosol concerned the installation commissioning, uh, fueling by wood chip and maintenance for three years of 10 biomass boilers. One of the more interesting features for those uh, so inclined was that the, one of the key witnesses was a chap called David Pickering, the former Wales rugby captain. He was a witness of the employer uh, and it's uh, maybe of interest, particularly if you're not a Welsh rugby supporter, the dishonour Judge Kaiser did not think very much of the evidence of Mr Pickering. Uh, but in any event, the parties fell out spectacularly. The employer failed to pay the purchase price or the agreed maintenance costs, and the contract came to an end in controversial circumstances. Among other matters, the employer alleged that the boilers were oversized and therefore inefficient as they failed to make the most, as I said, of the RHI. Uh, and the, this issue was played out over the meaning of the fitness for purpose obligation. It was common ground that there was an implied term that the boilers supplied be fit for purpose. The issue was as to the nature of that purpose. The employer argued that the purpose of efficient uh, 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 was the efficient heating of the locations within which they were to be installed, essentially to optimize um, uh, the, the income. Uh, the supplier argued that the purpose was, if you like, a threshold one of revenue generation from the RHI scheme and cost savings compared to fossil fuel heating costs. The judge considered in that case that negotiation evidence was uh, a factual matrix for the purpose of the analysis and determined that the primary purpose was, in fact, this threshold question to generate income from the RHI scheme uh, and secondarily only to save on fuel costs. On the facts of this case, the boilers were fit for purpose because they met those purposes, although they were oversized and therefore, to some extent at least, inefficient for their actual use. It was enough that they generated income from the RHI scheme, no obligation to ensure that the income uh, generated was at its maximum, was optimised. So um, uh, 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 the second of my themes uh, that arise in relation to green energy cases are what I call flawed asset claims. What do I mean by this? Well, wind farms, solar farms, and others are traded as assets in advance of or partway through their development. As we've seen, um, there's readily available capital for investment from public sources uh, and in state funding incentives. They are theoretically at least low risk investments with clear predictable, if relatively modest long term returns over a, to a greater or lesser degree, uh, 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 established time frame, uh, such as a 25 year operating life, 20 year operating life, as in the MTH and EON case that James mentioned. They're attractive, they are therefore attractive investments 
for institutional and longer term investors. They're very saleable, even at early stages of development or construction. And a common theme to some of the cases are disputes that occur when those assets turn out not to meet their how that what they've been billed. One, one such case is a case called Gwinty Moore off 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 to. Um, this uh, 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 concerned share purchase agreement or SPA concerning an operating new wind farm, including subsea export cables uh, uh, back into the grid. Less than one month following the completion of the sale, the first of two cables failed due to corrosion. And together, the two failed cables cost 15 million pounds uh, to repair. The SPA contained an indemnity clause uh, uh, which I've set out on the slide. If any of the assets are destroyed or damaged prior to completion, pre-completion damage, then following completion, the defendants shall indemnify the claimant against the full cost of reinstatement of any assets affected by that pre-completion damage. So in relation to the facts of this case, who carried the risk of these corroded failed cables? What, what does this in the claims brought under this indemnity, what, what does it mean? That gives rise to two questions. Uh, what was the time period encompassed by prior to completion? Uh, if any of the assets are destroyed or damaged prior to completion, was it from signature of the SPA? Uh, 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 in other words, execution through to completion, which was on the facts of this case, a short period of time, as argued by the, the vendor um, and defendant, or was it that all time before completion as argued by the purchaser? Secondly, what was meant by any of the assets being in quotes, destroyed or damaged? And the judgment was given by Lord Justice Phillips. Uh, that's because uh, he heard the trial, was made up to the Court of Appeal, uh, and then gave judgment uh, at that point. But it provides what I may say is an excellent example, excellent worked example, of the application of modern principles of contractual interpretation by reference to Arnold and Britain, Wooden Capita, etc., as you'll ever see. And so I, I do recommend you um, consider it. Uh, I won't be able to do it justice in this talk. Nevertheless, on the, on the first issue of the meaning of prior to completion, uh, the, the judge approached textual analysis uh, through five, uh, through five, uh, uh, through five um, analyses, streams of analysis. Firstly, by reference to the wording of the clause itself, and he made the point that uh, the uh, clause, which I've brought back up again, is worded in this way, if any of the assets are destroyed or damaged prior to completion. That use of the word are has a prospective meaning. Um, the purchaser's argument, which would include assets already damaged, did not fit with the express terms of the subject clause. Indeed, they would have used the words, if any of the assets have been destroyed or damaged prior to completion. Secondly, um, the understanding was by reference to the position of this clause uh, and by reference to the surrounding clauses. The clause before concerned the signature of the SPA uh, and the clause after concerned completion and its meaning. As the judge put it, uh, he said, the insertion between these provisions of an indemnity against pre-completion damage is readily understood as intended to relate to damage occurring between execution and completion. Thirdly, the judge noted that the contract also contained a limited warranty by the vendor as to the absence of damage to the assets as at the date of the SPA, limited in the sense of, um, to the best of the vendor's knowledge, the warranty was given as to the absence of damage. This warranty would be rendered pointless 
if the indemnity, the subject matter of the claim, covered all existing damage even prior to the execution of the contract. Uh, related to that is that, uh, fourthly, it would remove the incentive for disclosure by the vendor of existing damage um, uh, because the mechanism, which was the mechanism provided for the warranty. And finally, it was inconsistent with the express provision of caps on liability, separate caps for entitlements uh, uh, under the indemnity and under the warranty were provided. That simply couldn't work if the entitlements were overlapping. So as I say, a textbook um, application of the principles of contractual construction on the meaning, um, and indeed that's also true uh, for his analysis of our, our destroyed and damaged as well. Uh, unfortunately, there's no time to go through it now, but um, it, it has a very useful uh, uh, trawl of the, of the cases to date on the meaning of damage in construction and insurance context uh, and um, uh, an analysis and application of, uh, of commercial um, absurdity commercial, uh, giving it business common sense uh, as well. Uh, the judge then did also look at the contextual analysis, including alleged market practices, but he, he was persuaded that given the sophisticated, careful, professionally lawyer drafted documents, the context was not informative as to the issue of interpretation. It also contains a rare example albeit as a subsidiary alternative finding, uh, where a claim for rectification would have succeeded. Um, uh, the judge says, that, uh, goes through the analysis uh, 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 applied, um, uh, set out in the legal test by Lord Justice Leggett, which is the, the modern uh, uh, test uh, now applied in FCH, uh, FSHC. Uh, and he said, I found I find that the defendants would have been entitled to an order for rectification had that been necessary. Whilst a finding that a contract should be rectified is unusual, maybe more so in the light of the decision in SSHC, it may be less surprising for a court to find on an alternative basis that the parties had an actual common intention, which accords with the true interpretation of the contract. So I'm not sure if it takes your, uh, if you've got a rectification case much further, because you already have the interpretation of the existing words on your side, you obviously don't need to resort to rectification. Now, I mentioned this case of Toucan Energy Holdings and Wursal Energy, um, because although there is no cited judgment as yet, apart from in relation to an earlier spat on costs, uh, it was in fact the reason why I signed up to do this talk in the first place. I was in a five week trial last October and November and was expecting to be able to address you on various interesting aspects arising from that case, uh, which concerned 15 solar parks sold as a package in the, uh, by way of an SPA partway through their development. Um, I've set out in the slide there uh, uh, some of the issues that arose, but in any event, you'll have to wait uh, for the judgment to be published. Similarly, I would suggest you look out for a case called Equitix and Michael Fox. It's a matter going to be heard in the TCC next week, featuring four of my colleagues at Keating Chambers. Um, that too is a trial on alleged breaches of warranty and conditional in relation to yet another share sale agreement, this time in relation to a biomass boiler facility. Um, I, I will move on to the third of my themes, uh, but um, uh, James obviously touched upon MTH uh, and E.ON, so I won't spend uh, very long on it. Uh, uh, but of course, one of the themes on that case was the interplay between um, the um, fitness for purpose, the design obligation, that the design of the foundation shall ensure a lifetime of 20 years with the uh, uh, contractually uh, provided specification uh, the DMV standard that James mentioned, and the Supreme Court in that case sought to give effect to both requirements, but effectively the um, prescribed criteria of a design life of 20 years trumps the prescribed design. Um, 
Similarly, Biosol, the case I've mentioned, that considers implied fitness for purpose, and the, the standard in that case, as, as, as you will recall, uh, reflected um, uh, or, or had reference to the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme. Uh, and uh, as I uh, mentioned in the Toucan case, there's another design life obligation uh, that, that comes up in there, which will be interesting when, it, when you can see it. Uh, the fourth theme uh, is a common defect that arise in these sorts of cases, perhaps relatively uniquely. You've got the capacity of, of uh, central bits of kit that are required for these cases in biosol, the boilers were too large and therefore inefficient. In Toucan, uh, the transformers lack capacity to cope with the peaks of current flow from the inverters. And I, I think this is a theme with this emerging sector uh, that, uh, that applies because capacity issues reflect the changing and improving technologies in this sector. So for example, uh, solar disputes historically concerned solar panels and inverters that were it typically oversold and underperformed. And we're now in a position where there are much more effective, efficient solar panels and inverters. And so the subject matter now has moved on to the transformers and indeed batteries that are struggling to keep up with that level of performance. The second uh, topic is corrosion and fatigue, typically arising in relation to offshore wind, uh, which is so much subject to the forces of uh, the two elements of the ocean, sea and, and wind, comes up time and time again. Uh, and that's reflected in, the, as James mentioned, the failure of grouted connections, but also in the failure of welds and at openings, the weakest parts of the structure, such as cable entry points, uh, causing fatigue. Uh, we've seen corrosion, for example, also in that Gwynti Moore case. Thirdly, uh, as, as uh, I've alluded to before, uh, the topic of damage. What is, the, what is damage and the distinction between damage and defect? That is another theme to these cases. My final theme, which I will take very swiftly, um, because uh, I think probably it's slightly cheating, is the Equitix and Veolia uh, case. Um, it does have a green energy uh, uh, subject matter but it's hard, it's hard to say that the subject of this particular case would be unique, which is about um, uh, the uh, dispute resolution clause in the contract and the requirement that dispute resolution adjudicators be, in quotes, experts in the field of biomass energy plants. The question is whether or not that was a direction to the adjudicator nominating body uh, uh, for uh, a, a practitioner, effectively an engineer, biomass energy plants, or someone who is a litigator in the field of, um, uh, of, of, of biomass energy uh, uh, or, or some other legal expert. Uh, and Mrs. Justice Jefford um, uh, came to the conclusion uh, that uh, it, it was that wider scope um, you're referring to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, uh, and therefore you're expecting uh, a, uh, a, a, an individual who is practiced in dispute resolution, uh, rather than specifically more limited extent in the technical content of uh, what's meant by biomass energy plants. There's much more to that decision, uh, and um, uh, so I do suggest you read it but I think there's hope for us lawyers to get instructed as adjudicators in the future, uh, um, even where uh, adjudication clauses are limited in that way. So what can I say? The future is bright, the future is green. The prospects for this sector are extremely positive, the non-contentious work and inevitably, uh, sad that may be, in disputes. Last week, you may have seen the government of Denmark announced what one cabinet minister there described as the largest construction project in Danish history, providing for the largest offshore wind array the world has ever seen and the first artificial wind island, which I've shown on my slide. They're going to start with a mere three gigawatts of capacity. That's going to provide enough electricity to, um, to um, fuel three million homes 
Uh, they will build onto that over time to many times that, so as to export electrical power, not just to Denmark, but to the neighbors, which are shown, including good old uh, GB. And you'll see here the island that's proposed to be constructed, and that's simply to assist in its operation and maintenance. Uh, close to home, um, we've got the Gravney Cleave Hill Solar Park, which will have six times the capacity of the Southwick Estate Solar Park, enough energy to power 91,000 homes. Uh, new nuclear, uh, we've barely touched upon, but uh, it's really a warrant, uh, it's a topic of its own, but Hinkley Point C, for example, is estimated to provide energy for six million homes. So as this sector continues to, to develop, uh, so will the law in relation to it. What I suspect will happen will be further development in the five themes I've identified, particularly in relation to government investments and incentives, perhaps the flawed asset claims, and also the types of defects that one sees in these cases. No doubt there'll be new themes that arise, providing new challenges, new opportunities for all of us on this um, uh, webinar. So uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm going to hand back uh, to, uh, to Lucy now. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, stop share. Um, there, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, that was very interesting. Um, please do put questions in the chat box. We've got some already. Um, I'd like to start with one that I think was uh, for Jane about Halliburton, um, which is, do you think there might have been a different outcome if the arbitrator in question had been less well known or less respected? And I think I'm particularly interested in that. You, you, were, you were mentioning that obviously the Halliburton case was on English law and the, the position is subjective under many of the other arbitral rules. Um, would you think that could make a difference? Uh, yeah. Um, well, thanks, Lucy. Um, yes, I mean, it, it, if if the if if the Supreme Court were considering a different legal position, then of course subjectivity might might um, might produce a different result. I mean, <clears throat> the the question asks about if if an arbitrator were less well known or less less respected. Um, I mean, it, it's important, obviously, to remember that it's not a case about actual bias. <clears throat> it's a it's a case about apparent bias. So. As obviously, if you had a, a sort of rogue arbitrator who, who was sort of not well respected in that sense, uh, and there was a possibility of actual bias, then that would be different. Um, I mean, the, the problem that, ar that arises in cases where you have multiple references, multiple appointments in different references, is that it gives the party that has the common, the common party, an unfair advantage because of knowledge or, or an understanding of how the common arbitrator might react to certain arguments that the other party doesn't have. So it, the, the, the problem with it is an inequality of knowledge and an inequality of opportunity to communicate with the arbitrator. And um, that's what causes or, would, or might cause the uh, independent, the, the uh, uh, impartial observer to think that there could be a possibility of bias. So um, that isn't an issue that's necessarily going to be affected by the arbitrators standing in, in, the, in the arbitration community, how well respected they are. But it is undoubtedly relevant to, to the sort of question overall, how uh, Ken Rockison actually did deal with the issue as it arose. And of course, a very, very respected and very experienced arbitrator and, and was able to deal with it in a, in a pretty much model way. Um, I mean, there is an interesting point, I think, that arises as a result of the question. Um, in fact, which the question highlights, which is that, as I say, the issue is an inequality of knowledge and it's sort of it's, it's, it's an issue that arises as between the parties, not not really an issue of the arbitrator per se. And Section 24 of the Arbitration Act, of course, refers to the arbitrators, the arbitrators impartiality. Um, and arguably the problem, I think, that arises in um, this sort of situation where there's multiple references isn't actually a problem of impartiality at all. Um, but there is no other ground under Section 24 or anywhere else in the Arbitration Act that you could actually bring a, a challenge yeah. to arbitrators. So there is a question 
and, and you can see that in both the reasoning of the course of appeal and the Supreme Court, it's trying to sort of fit what I've always referred to as sort of square peg into a round hole in the sense that the arbitration act doesn't really deal with that particular problem. Yeah. Um, interesting. So, yeah. I mean, I think it's an interesting, an interesting question and quite an interesting point. I've got, there's a question in the chat from Julian saying question for Simon. I think you might mean Sam. Um, do you type it in Julian? Cause I think we, I think you're all automatically on silence. You have to write it. Um, but in the meantime, Sam, um, you mentioned, um, trends at the end of your talk um mm -hmm. and there's a question on the chat as to what you see as being those future what, what do you think those future trends will be in in in, in green energy disputes yeah um well the, definitely these projects as i hope i i demonstrated they're getting bigger in scale and scope um and i wonder whether that will cause them to be treated rather differently uh, governments will be, such as this uh, island in, of Denmark, are going to be behind the scheme. So we may end up with some of these um, uh, biggest uh, developments, certainly at the high end of the, the contractual chain, all going into the private, like nuclear, uh, so that we may unfortunately not have so many uh, in, in court. I mean, obviously, as these big developments roll out, there will be civil disputes. You can expect more disputes with dredging contractors, for example, and the main contractors. Um, and uh, I suspect also after this state of SPA disputes, one would expect the investment industry, the, the, big, uh, the big pension schemes, the big institutional uh, investors to perhaps uh, be a little more guarded in their investment once they read a few of these cases about uh, <laughs> claims concerning SPAs going, going yeah. wrong. But um, we'll, 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 have to, we'll have to see. I think well, some of these schemes are not quite matching up to the low risk, lo low yield. Uh, well, when, uh, when did an innovative engineering project ever, when was it ever low, low risk? But the, um, that, what, what you've just said, Sam, links in, Julian has written his question. He said, um, you mentioned that it's pre-written to such contracts that dispute that the disputes are determined in the private arena, i.e. in arbitration as opposed to the courts. And he's asking why, why do you think that's the case? Well, I think um, for nuclear, and I think probably more generally, it's to say, it's one, because you're in the political sphere. So, uh, and, and it was the case uh, uh, with, um, uh, I'm trying to think of what the development was, but, you're in the political sphere and it's terribly embarrassing. So, for example, a case I think you were involved in, Lucy, Wembley Stadium, that was very much played out in the courts. Yeah. And um, all, 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 although it, it, it's not, not a, a absolutely at the forefront of, of, of um, sort of political reporting, it's nevertheless embarrassing for a yeah. government not to get its project over the line in time. Uh, for nuclear, of course, there's also the fear factor associated with any issues concerning nuclear energy. So I think that was the, the reason, but I suspect governments essentially want to protect themselves by keeping it private. And, uh, and there also is an extent to which you as a party, as an employer, or even, indeed even as a contractor, retain greater control. The arbitrator is to some extent uh, your servant. It may, it may not be, uh, uh, I mean, we're heading back to the Halliburton territory, but um, you do tend, the parties have control of the process. You're not having a judge telling you what you can budget your case for or making you fill in a disclosure review document, for example. I'm being trite, but you, you know what I mean. If you're in private, you have greater control about how you want to resolve your dispute. Yes, I mean, that's definitely theoretically the case, isn't it? Although I often do refer to international arbitration as the place where no one can hear you scream. Um, Mark, Mark Crossley, you put your hand up, but if you've got, I can't let you talk because I haven't got the power, but if you type your, oh no, it's gone, that wasn't, it wasn't a criticism, I was going to say, if you've got a question, please write it in the chat. <laughs> um, in, um, we've got time, I think, for a few more. Um, James, there was a question right at the beginning, which I hadn't seen, which was about um, the interveners in the Halliburton case. This is a rather sophisticated question. Um, do, does the, what's the position of the interveners? And does that have any, who were the interveners as well? And does that have any relevance to the implications of the decision? 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, the, the intervenors sort of fell into two, two groups, really. There's the um, LCIA, ICC, CIR group that were kind of saying, look, we all want, you know, a uh, stricter approach to disclosure, all of that sort of stuff. Um, on the other side, you had the uh, GAFTA and LMAA interveners who were um, saying, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on. Um, things are very different in our world. Thank you very much. You know, we, we've got, you know, it's very common for, for us to have, um, you know, the same arbitrator appointed in, in multiple references. In fact, that's exactly what we want. Uh, everybody knows that. We've got a very small number of arbitrators who are able to actually, um, you know, arbitrate these disputes and people want the certainty, actually want the certainty of knowing what those arbitrators' views are likely to be. So, yeah. um, I mean, I suppose the question is, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the LMAA type position obviously does apply only where not only it is in fact the case that you get multiple appointments, but that the parties are happy with the, the, the consequences and the implications of that. And so there is in fact a, a sort of, you know, common, common understanding. It's, it's part, of, part of the reason why you go down that route. Um, I mean, although in the sorts of disputes we, I was talking about and, and, uh, and Sam was talking about, um, you know, the Robin Rigg type issues where you can see, well, there would be a common, uh, common subject matter across a, a very large number potentially of, of disputes and arbitrations. That doesn't quite apply in the same way because um, you know you've got it's not just the fact of multiple appointments; it's the fact that um, that's done for a certain reason, and, and everyone is happy with that. And, and and there's no reason, there's no duty to disclose in those circumstances. Mm. Interesting. Um, I think we're pretty much at the end um, of our time, um, so I just want to say thank you very much, Sam and James. Again, that was really really interesting talks, and thank you to everyone who's joined and asked questions. Um, the recording of this will be on our YouTube channel by the end of the week and the slides will be available on the website um, and the recording and the slides of part one are already up on our Keating website and up on our, on our YouTube channel as well. So um, please, um, please do avail yourself of our, uh, of our amazing <laughs> digital uh, content. Thanks very much everybody and see you again. Um, for another Keating seminar next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.